On a warm Friday evening in the city of London, Sabina Nessa plans to meet friends at a pub only eight minutes from her home. But unbeknownst to them, or even herself, she would never make it there. And in fact, this half-mile walk would have dire consequences. What exactly happened to Sabina Nessa during this half-mile walk? And following an extensive investigation, who would be found accountable for her disappearance? Welcome back to Coffee House Crime. My name is Adrian, and in this video we're talking about the case of Sabina Nessa. Sabina was an ambitious and charismatic young woman with many plans in her life. But following one fateful evening, all of this would change forever. Of course the questions are what happened to Sabina Nessa, who is responsible, and why? This video investigates those questions. And by the way, I post solved, unsolved, and strange cases here on a weekly basis. So if that sounds like a kind of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffee House Crime. So with that said, pull up a seat, grab your favourite coffee, and sit back. This is the case of Sabina Nessa. Our case today takes place in the sprawling city of London, which of course is the capital to the United Kingdom. London is a city that's been present for around two millennia, which gives it great historical significance and prosperity. It's a rich and diverse city famous for its architecture, commerce, entertainment, and of course tourism. When most people think of London, they think of Buckingham Palace, Big Ben, the Royal Family, and the Underground. But to me, this city offers endless places to eat, relax, and of course, drink coffee. Due to the age of the city, London's skyline is characterised by the many styles of architecture found throughout its history. From old Roman buildings to medieval castles, all the way to some of the most unique skyscrapers found in our modern day climate. Now, modern London has some of the highest costs of living in the world, which unfortunately makes it inaccessible for many Brits to live. Inversely, this is probably one of the reasons London also has the highest number of millionaires than any other city in the world. In today's case, we'll be focusing on the borough of Greenwich, located just south of the River Thames. And it's here, in this historic London borough, that we meet 28-year-old Sabina Nessa. Before settling here, Sabina was born north of London in the county of Bedfordshire. She was one of three daughters, to her loving mother Azabun Nessa and her father Abda Roof. They had originally migrated to England from Bangladesh, hoping to give their growing family a more comfortable way to live. Azabun was a full-time mother, while Sabina's father worked in a small restaurant serving both Indian and Bangladeshi food. And although this was a busy job for him, Sabina's parents always made sure to make room for plenty of family time. Growing up within a loving family, Sabina was happy as a child. She was caring and outgoing, and she had a love for animals, often asking the family for more pets. This ranged from tropical fish all the way through to budgies, to go with the three cats that they already owned. This is just a childhood memory, but her parents recall her often sitting in the back garden to play with her feline companions. And to go with her love for animals, Sabina also loved to be around people, and found a great interest in learning more about them. As a result, when she graduated school in 2011, Sabina decided to move away and study sociology at the University of Greenwich, leading her to fully achieve her bachelor's degree in the year 2014. After her graduation, she returned to Bedfordshire and settled back into family life, spending a few years to find her feet through adulthood. It's in this time that she learned her aspiration in life was to teach, and more specifically towards helping younger children. However, Sabina didn't want to limit herself to the UK. She had aspirations to teach while abroad in the future, and for that, a teaching degree was required. And so, after heading back to the books, she once again graduated in the year 2020 at the University of Bedfordshire. Following her graduation, Sabina moved back down to London to gain some teaching experience. She landed a job at Rushy Green Primary School in Lewisham, and through this experience, her passion flourished. Sabina was loved by her students, which was a class of roughly 30 children, all aged 5 to 6 years old. And while she loved her job here, the experience would also help her reach her goal of teaching children in the Middle East, so this was all a double win. Sabina had her life in order with her future steps properly laid out, and as a 28-year-old living in London, she had a rich social life, often meeting up with her friends around her local area of Greenwich. We're moving forward to September of 2021. It was a Friday, and the 17th of that month. London was gearing up for another usual summer weekend, and Sabina had arranged to meet a couple of her friends at one of their local pubs called The Depot, which was less than 10 minutes down the road from her flat on Anstall Road in Kidbrook. Now, London isn't known to be one of the safest cities for a young woman walking alone, so Sabina would often try to avoid going out by herself at night. 
and otherwise she would make sure to walk along well-lit paths and habited areas. Sabina had two options to get to the depot. She could walk through the residential streets, or cut through the adjacent Cater Park to then walk along a well-lit, busy main road. The problem is, Sabina never liked Cater Park. She would always feel uneasy walking through that area, but tonight, she was running late. And besides, Cater Park was very small. She wouldn't be in there for more than a couple minutes, as she was just passing through. To add to this, there was still daylight, and the sun was still peeking over the horizon. And so, at 8.30pm that evening, Sabina put on her makeup, found one of her favourite dresses, and headed out of her flat, walking down Astle Road before entering Cater Park. And meanwhile, over at the depot, Sabina's friends were patiently waiting for her to arrive. Sabina never showed up on time, and after adding an extra half an hour on top of that, she was still nowhere to be seen. To add to this, she wasn't replying to text messages or her phone calls either. I know I say this often in cases like this, but this was very unusual for Sabina, and her friends had no idea what to do. They figured that maybe something had come up and she could no longer make the gathering, so instead the evening carried on without her, as at this time there wasn't much cause for concern. But Sabina had every intention to meet her friends, she'd even left her flat only 8 minutes away to join them, just she never made it to her destination. It never crossed her friends' minds that perhaps something sinister had happened to her, as after all, who would expect anything bad to happen in an 8 minute walk, in daylight, in the middle of England's largest city? But sadly, in reality, these assumptions couldn't have been any further from the truth. Saturday the 18th For most in the leafy suburb of Greenwich, the morning started like any other. It was a mild day, and Kidbrook was bustling with activity. Some people were jogging, some taking their kids out for the weekend, and others were simply having a lion. One of those out later in the afternoon was a lone dog walker making his way through Cater Park. He was busy taking in the fresh air when his dog began to act strangely amongst the tall grass on the edge of the park. This was odd. He walked closer to get a better look, and after gaining proximity, he realised a person laying in the long grass, covered in several branches. Thinking that perhaps they'd enjoyed a few too many drinks the night before, and therefore passed out in the underbrush, he called out to the figure. But there was no response. With a sudden drop in his stomach, he walked even closer to get a better look. It was a young woman, and all of a sudden he recognised a distinct flash of red across her head. He now realised that he was stood in the middle of the crime scene, and what he was looking at was no innocent affair. He backed up immediately, dialing 999 shortly before 5.30 to report the discovery of a body in Cater Park. Police arrived very shortly afterward, closing the area to the public in order to investigate the scene, and tragically, the body was quickly identified to be that of Sabina Nessa. The public were absolutely devastated to hear of the news. With short proximity and length, Sabina should have felt safe to walk through her local park. And even worse, the police were adamant that the park was very likely busy over the time she'd been slain. A knock at her parents' front door would lead to a world crashing down around them. Sabina's family were notified of her death, something which no parent should ever have to receive. And what the family were facing now was the road to recovery over something impossible to get over. Vigils were quickly arranged over the following days. Flowers were placed, and candles delicately lit. Friends, family, the children she used to teach, and the rest of the local community were all in despair. And this sense of pain and anger would give investigators the drive they needed to find out what exactly happened to Sabina Nessa. The first step in their plan of action was to urge any member of the public to come forward if they'd seen anything strange or out of the ordinary that evening. This included asking people to share surveillance and dashcam footage from all cameras in the local area. All of this footage was thoroughly searched, and their efforts wouldn't be in vain, as shortly after this, police found some rather concerning details. They found surveillance footage of a man who was seen walking along Pegler Square around the suspected time of the assault, Pegler Square being a road that runs next to Cater Park. In this footage, the man is seen holding an unknown object in his hand while suspiciously looking around. He then takes a good look behind him, puts up his hood, and disappears from view. And not long after this on another camera, a silver car was spotted driving away from the area he was walking towards. It was therefore suspected that this car belonged to the man. 
Prior to this footage being released to the public, the police had actually arrested two other men in relation to Sabina's murder. These unnamed individuals were 38 and 41 years old. However, in both of these cases, there was a very distinct lack of evidence of their involvement, and both of them were therefore released. But this surveillance footage was a great lead for investigators, as it placed a suspect and his face in the exact area Sabina's body was discovered. On September the 24th, seven days after her murder, this surveillance footage was released to the public in hopes it would bring someone forward. Rumours started to circulate, and not long after this, several anonymous tips from the public were made, all of which identified the suspect to be Kochi Salamach, a 36-year-old gas station attendant from Albania. Living in Eastbourne, located on the south coast of England, Kochi lived 65 miles away from where Sabina was found. So, why was he seen in Kidbrook that Friday evening? Expert analysis confirmed that the surveillance footage did appear to be Kochi Salamaj, and following this information, he was tracked down to his small flat and arrested. Initially, Kochi refused to talk to police throughout questioning, which is never a good sign. However, after eventually being charged for the murder of Sabina, he had one question to ask. What will happen to me if I open up now and say everything? We don't know what kind of deal was made, but it's from that point onwards that Kochi revealed everything. It was on September the 17th, the same day Sabina had disappeared, that Kochi checked himself into a room at the Grand Hotel. A five-star hotel located in Eastbourne, which suspiciously is only five minutes away from where he lived. The staff here knew Kochi, and they knew he lived nearby, and this was for one simple reason. His recently estranged ex-wife, Ionella, was currently working at the hotel. This made staff very uneasy, as Kochi would often loiter around the lobby and seemingly wait for his ex-wife to appear. And all in the meanwhile, Kochi would often eye up any woman passing his way, making the staff and several patrons of the hotel very uncomfortable. Ionella was growing concerned over his strange behaviour. She wanted to reason with the man, so she agreed to talk to him in his car, and this is where his main motive for booking a room became clear. She was understandably nervous while with him, as one of the primary reasons to their separation was due to his violence. In fact, Kochi had choked Ionella several times on the weeks leading up to their separation. He was clearly unhinged. All the same, she wasn't going to let him intimidate her. Instead, she tried to reason with him, but this didn't go very well. As midway through the conversation, Kochi then moved to the back seat of his car and suggested to his ex-wife that they have sex. Ionella refused. She was dumbfounded that he would even suggest such a thing in a time like this. She therefore left him in the back seat of his car, alone. Kochi remained there, angry and frustrated, for quite some time. Eventually, moving into the driver's seat, he raced through the car park and exited, disappearing into the day. Kochi never returned to the hotel, nor did he head home. Instead, he would make a 65-mile journey to London, where he then hoped to disappear amongst the streets and find a woman to sleep with. And in his mind, he would achieve this by any means necessary. Driving all the way from the south coast into London, he ended up in Kidbrook, where he then parked his car and entered a local Sainsbury supermarket. Surveillance cameras captured him browsing the home section, where he eventually bought a rolling pin before returning to his car. His next decision was critical, yet deeply flawed. In his frenzied anger, Kochi had to weigh up what to do next. Calm down and process his emotions like a man, or take his anger out on an innocent bystander. His choice was the latter. Swapping out a rolling pin for an emergency traffic triangle, he exited the vehicle and took to the streets. As he made his way to Pegler Square, the sun was beginning to set. Publicly released surveillance footage captured his movements, and looking to his right as he passes the camera, he spotted the young Sabina Nessa, unaware, unrelated, and unprovoking. She was making her way into Cater Park. Taking his opportunity, Kochi put up his hood and followed Sabina into the park. He followed her along the park's path for a short while, picking up his pace in the process, and after realising no one else was around, he sprinted. She turned to face her assailant, but before she could get a good look at him, he bore down on her with a folded traffic triangle. Kochi rained down a total of 34 strikes to Sabina's head and body, before she collapsed onto a park bench, and grabbing her limp body, he then dragged her into a nearby underbrush. He pulled her clothes down before beginning to strangle her. He held down on her neck until her heart beat for the last time. Following his actions, Kochi covered Sabina's body with several branches, picked up the many pieces of his shattered traffic triangle, wiped down the park bench, and then disappeared into the night. 
leaving her body to be found the very next day. And after returning to his car, he calmly drove off, never to return to Greenwich again. Halfway back home, Kodji stopped near Tunbridge Wells in Kent, and threw the emergency traffic sign in the River Tees in hopes that it would be lost forever. And after dumping his weapon, he then carried on with his journey, arriving back at the Grand Hotel in Eastbourne at just past midnight. He was caught by a surveillance camera while heading through the lobby to go to his room. He then went back to his job at an ESO garage the very next day, and he carried on with his life as if nothing had happened. That would of course be until the police finally came knocking on his door. Amongst the pain and confusion, autopsies would come back inconclusive around the cause of her death, but between the beating and strangling, we can likely assume it to be either. Although Kochi's attack was premeditated, the person which he exacted his rage upon was completely random, which is a terrifying detail, as this isn't something you can prevent. And unfortunately, that is exactly what happened to Sabina. She was simply the first lone woman to cross his hellbent path. She didn't have a chance after that point. Although the attack was concluded to be sexually motivated, there was actually no evidence of penetrative assault, only the removal of clothes from the victim. Which makes you wonder, what really gave Kochi his gratification? Was it the act of violence, pleasure, or simply playing God? Despite his confession, Kochi initially pleaded not guilty to the murder of Sabina. He did however admit that he was responsible for Sabina's death, which if you ask me, doesn't make any sense at all. Kochi was held in prison until February of 2022, where he was then due to appear at the Old Bailey in London for a pre-sentencing hearing, and while here, he would have to face Sabina's family. As with most spineless killers, Kochi refused to show up to his hearing. He instead opted to stay in his cell, although he did simultaneously change his plea from not guilty to guilty. This enraged Sabina's family. They were furious that the coward wouldn't show his face or own up to his crimes. As a result of his guilty plea, Kochi was sentenced to life in prison, with a minimum sentence of 36 years behind bars. Hopefully he will never taste freedom again, and Kochi will have to reach the age of 72 before being given that chance. Kochi committed a predatory and savage attack on a young woman, who should have felt safe in her own environment. Sabina had every right to be walking alone that evening, without any fear over a half mile walk from home. But alas, this safety was breached. The attack sparked a city-wide campaign into raising awareness about women's safety in London, offering out advice to women, urging everyone to look out for each other, and hold one another accountable where needs be. As many of you likely know, several other cases with similar circumstances happened during this time. This includes Sarah Everard, and my previously covered case of Bieber Henry and Nicole Smallman. Sabina Nessa's family, who were deeply saddened by the loss of Sabina, have been holding candlelit vigils and memorials ever since the day of her murder. Her extended family continue to express their love and loss over a daughter, a sister, a teacher, a friend. Sabina's sisters remember her as beautiful, talented, and caring. She continues to be their inspiration to always put themselves first, and to never let anybody put them down. Throughout all of the vigils and love for Sabina, it's clear to see that she has left a huge hole in her community. She had so much life ahead of her, with plans that will now forever remain unfulfilled. And tragically, in an act of pure randomness, her entire life was cut short over the fickle and temporary rage of an evil and stupid man. The most terrifying part about this case is the lack of chance that Sabina was given. She had no way of keeping herself safe from the situation. It does make you wonder, if no woman can walk 10 minutes without feeling safe from idiots like this, then how can anyone feel safe? If you'd like to see a similar case to this one, then please check out my video of Daniel Hussein. If not, I'll be back again very soon for a fresh case. Anyway, thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you found this case interesting or insightful, then please remember to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. As always, please share your thoughts in the comment section down below, and I'll see you again real soon for another video. But until that moment arrives, make sure to look after each other. Goodbye.